Hello everyone and welcome to the AHA Foundation's first webinar on honor-based violence and forced marriage. My name is Julia Standler and I'm an attorney working with the AHA Foundation in New York City. I'm joined today by our Executive Director and General Counsel, Manon D. Felice. For those of you unfamiliar with our work, the AHA Foundation is a nonprofit organization that works to prevent and address violence committed in the name of culture and religion. That's all cultures and all religions. We are particularly focused on the issues of female genital cutting, forced marriage, and honor violence in the United States. Monin and I are very pleased to be joined by such a diverse audience of direct service providers and advocates today. We're looking forward to hearing your comments, questions, and your feedback on this presentation. On your screen, you should see a chat icon. Please use this feature of the webinar program to submit in writing any questions that you may have. If we don't respond to your question in the course of the presentation, we'll do our best to respond to you individually. This webinar addresses the issues of honor-based violence and forced marriage. Although these issues are often hidden from public view, they are very, re very real problems in the United States. This session is intended to provide a practical overview on these subjects. Our goal is to ensure that every at-risk individual who reaches out for help has access to a service provider who understands their predicament. What is honor violence? Honor violence is a form of violence against women. The motive of honor violence is for the perpetrator to protect or regain his honor, the honor of his family, or that of the community at large. Who are the victims? The victims of honor violence are targeted because their actual or perceive, perceived behavior is considered shameful by their families. More generally, a victim may be targeted if she is considered to have violated the cultural or religious norms of her family or community. Honor violence is rarely an isolated, one-off incident. Rather, Honor violence tends to involve systematic control over the victim by members of her family. This control may begin at a young age and escalate over a period of time. Honor violence may be perpetrated by a single individual. It can also be a group campaign of violence and harassment committed by an entire family, along with members of their community. Honor violence can take numerous forms. It can include verbal abuse, threats, stalking, harassment, forcible confinement, physical violence, sexual violence, and even homicide. The phenomenon of honor violence is not unique to any one ethnic or cultural group. Honor violence occurs in many different and diverse communities. In North America, cases of honor violence have involved families from countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Egypt, Bangladesh, and India. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. How is honor violence different from domestic violence? Honor violence shares several features with domestic violence, and it's not always easy to draw a bright line distinction between a case described as domestic violence and one involving honor. In many cases, domestic violence and, and honor violence will overlap considerably. However, there are several key ways in which honor violence differs from domestic violence. First, the nature of the relationship. In a traditional domestic violence scenario, the perpetrator of violence is involved or has previously been involved in an intimate or romantic relationship with the victim. She may be his wife, ex-wife, girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, mother of a child in common, or intimate partner. With honor-based violence, the victim can be any family member whose behavior is deemed unacceptable. Single versus multiple perpetrators. Domestic violence typically involves harm inflicted by a single perpetrator without the aid or support of the family or the community. In an honor violence scenario, multiple family or community members may be involved in a campaign of violence against the victim. For example, the father may be physically violent while the mother engages in emotional abuse or manipulation, 
All this at the same time as a sibling is monitoring the victim's behavior and reporting back to his parents. Family members may band together to deny any allegation of wrongdoing and to cover up any appearance of impropriety. For this reason, it's especially important for service providers, along with law enforcement, to recognize the role often played by multiple family members in an honor violence scenario. Perception of criminality. The perpetrators of domestic violence typically understand that they are committing a crime. In the cycle of violence, the perpetrator often feels guilt and fears being caught or discovered as an abuser. In an honor violence scenario, it is not uncommon to find perpetrators who do not believe that they are committing a crime. They often feel that their conduct is justified, perhaps even required, because of the victim's behavior. This attitude may be rooted in deeply held cultural and religious beliefs or even the legal system of the family's country of origin. To highlight this point, let's consider the example of a murder that occurred in Queens, New York. The victim was a young woman named Samia, who was engaged to marry a much older man named Farid Popal. Samia's parents had arranged the marriage over her objection. On the day of her death, Samia told Farid that she did not wish to marry him and that she in fact had a boyfriend. This prompted a brutal attack in which Farid killed Samia and then burned and dismembered her body. Farid's brother helped him dispose of the body, which has never been recovered. In the aftermath of the killing, Farid said this to a friend. In Afghanistan, she would be considered a whore for the way that she lived. She would be killed and I would be a hero. Farid was convicted of murder in 2006 and is now serving a life sentence. His brother was also convicted for his role in disposing of the body. But the scenario that played out in this case, and Farid's apparent belief that his actions were justified, sadly, this is not unique. Support of the perpetrator. A perpetrator of domestic violence will typically not have the support or encouragement of his family or the victim's family. He will likely take steps to hide his violent behavior, behavior which is not expressly condoned by family or community. In an honor violence scenario, a perpetrator's family will often share his belief that the victim brought on the violence by her own behavior. The perpetrator may have the support of religious leaders and other community members and may even have the support of the victim's family. Ostracism of the victim. This is another key distinction between honor violence and domestic violence. While this isn't true in every case, of course, a victim of domestic violence may have a support network of family and friends who encourage her to leave an abusive relationship. So, while a DV victim may internalize the abuser's message that she deserves the abuse because of her conduct, this perception will likely not be reinforced by the family and community. By comparison, a victim of honor violence is likely to be shunned by her family and community because of her perceived dishonorable behavior. She will face heavy pressure to change her actions so as to bring peace to the family and restore its honor. Because of the culture in which she was brought up, she may believe that she deserves the abuse she is suffering. And the final distinction between honor violence and domestic violence that we highlight for you today is religious coercion. Religion may play a very different role for victims in an honor violence scenario. In these situations, the victim may fear religious repercussions for going against the family and may face pressure from religious leaders in the community to change her conduct. In contrast, while some religious leaders in traditionally conservative religions may pressure an abused spouse to remain in a domestic violence situation to avoid divorce, this approach is becoming less accepted, and religious coercion in this context does not usually extend to non-spouse victims of violence. Now, a note on male victims. While the victims of honor violence are most commonly female, males may also be targeted. Here are some common reasons why a male family member may be subject to honor violence. If he is gay or perceived to be gay. If he is discovered to be dating outside of his cultural community. 
or if he resists an arranged marriage. These are very real scenarios that may render a young man or boy at risk of honor violence from his family. At this point, we'd like to discuss a few case examples. The first example we'll tell you of is that of the Shafia sisters. These three sisters, Zinab, 19, Sahar, 17, and Giti, 13, were born in Afghanistan. After living in a couple other Middle Eastern countries, they immigrated to Canada with their parents and siblings in 2007. Now a quick note on this family. The girl's father had been previously married to a woman named Rona. When Rona was unable to conceive children, he took a second wife, and that second wife was the girl's mother. While in Canada, the three girls easily adopted Western culture and became what's known as typical Canadian teenagers. They wore Western clothing, they wore makeup, they went to the mall with their friends, and the two older girls had boyfriends. Their parents, in particular their father, did not approve of this behavior. The Shafia sisters told numerous authorities that they were afraid of their parents and of their brother Hamid, who served as disciplinarian in their father's absence. The girls made numerous attempts to alert the authorities to violence in their home. In May 2008, Sahar told a teacher about physical violence by her brother that was inflicted at her parents' request, along with emotional abuse by her mother. Child Protective Services were called and they conducted an interview. Two days after the initial CPS interview, Sahar claimed things had improved at home and was wearing a hijab. CPS deemed the complaint founded, but the case was closed when Sahar stopped cooperating. In April 2009, Zainab fled to a woman's shelter to escape abuse at home. Sahar and Giti called 911 because they were so afraid of how their family would react. During the police interview that was conducted away from the parents, the girls reported physical abuse the previous week because they came home late from the mall. Giti reported that their father often threatened to kill them. Both girls told the police that they were afraid of their father and wanted to leave home. Child Protective Services became involved again, and this time they interviewed the girls in front of their parents. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, the girls stopped talking and recanted some of their previous allegations of abuse. After two subsequent interviews, CPS closed the file. In May 2009, Sahar attempted suicide. CPS was called again and they conducted another interview, during which Sahar reported violence by her brother. The caseworker noted that she was extremely scared and crying. Sahar told the caseworker that her parents had not spoken to her for months and that she was being pressured to wear a hijab and was being held out of school. But after learning that her allegations would be reported to her parents, Sahar stopped cooperating. In a subsequent interview, Sahar minimized the previous allegations and said that things were better at home. June 2009. A teacher noticed that Sahar was missing school and coming in late and asked her what was going on. Sahar said that she was afraid of her father, who was due to return from a trip to Dubai. She was afraid that her brother was going to tell him that she was a whore. The teacher called CPS and asked for Sahar's caseworker from the previous report. CPS relayed that there was no caseworker assigned and advised the teacher to find a shelter in the community. On June 30th, 2009, the bodies of the three girls, along with the body of Rona, their father's first wife, were discovered in a car submerged in a small canal. In January 2012, the girls' father, mother, and brother were all convicted of murder and were each sentenced to life in prison. In the course of the police investigation, the police installed wiretaps in the family vehicle. And you can see on your screen some quotes that the father made about the girls after they were dead. I'm not going to read them, but you can read them to yourself to see sort of the nature of the comments that we're talking about here. And based on these comments, it's clear that there was no motivation for this killing other than the idea of honor.
The second case example we'd like to discuss is that of Noor al-Maleki. Noor was born in Iraq and came to the United States with her family when she was four years old. Noor grew up to become an American teenager wearing Western clothing and makeup, listening to contemporary music, and socializing with boys. Noor's parents, particularly her father, strongly disapproved of her lifestyle. In 2007, Noor was tricked by her family into traveling to Iraq. There, she was forced to marry her cousin. When she returned to the U.S. with her family, she continued living in their home. Tension within the family escalated, and after numerous altercations, Noor left and moved into her own apartment. She obtained a police escort just to get her belongings. Such was her fear of her parents. Noor tried to support herself with jobs at restaurants, but her parents learned where she was working and came to harass her at work. This forced her to quit each position. Unable to maintain a job, Noor returned home for a brief period and then went to live with another Iraqi family whom she had known since childhood. Noor's family was enraged by this move and began harassing her and the family, once to the point that police were called. In October 2009, four months after moving in with this Iraqi family, Noor and Amal, the mother, spotted Noor's father at the local welfare office where Noor was helping Amal apply for benefits. Noor texted her friends that she had seen her father describing him as evil and saying that he made her feel so shaky. Noor's father left the welfare office, and a short while later, Noor and Amal also left and began walking across the parking lot. As they walked, Noor's father drove headfirst into them, striking both women with his Jeep. He then fled the scene, and with assistance from his wife, son, and other family members, fled the country. He was apprehended in London nine days later. Amal survived with serious injuries, and Noor died 13 days later. In February 2011, Noor's father, Fale, was convicted of second-degree murder, aggravated assault, and leaving the scene of the accident. He was sentenced to 34 and a half years in prison. In taped conversations with Noor's mother while he was incarcerated, Fale had the following to say about his daughter. For an Iraqi, honor is the most valuable thing. No one messed up our life except Noor. No one hates his daughter, but honor is precious and we are a tribal society. I didn't kill someone off the street. I tried to give her a chance. These two cases obviously represent the most extreme forms of honor violence. Both cases were reported widely in the national news media as well. But it's important to note that there have been many, many other cases involving honor violence, even honor killings, that have not received such widespread attention. Our organization has commissioned a study into the incidence of honor violence in the United States. Although we do not have concrete results yet, the preliminary numbers are quite disturbing. All this is to say that honor violence and even honor killing is a very real problem, and it's absolutely something that we as service providers need to be alive to. Before we move on to the next topic of discussion, does anyone have any questions that they haven't yet submitted? All right, so we'll move on to the topic of forced marriage. A forced marriage occurs when an individual is forced, coerced, threatened, or tricked to marry without her informed consent. Forced marriage is a very real problem in the United States. In September 2011, the Tahari Justice Center released survey results that found as many as 3,000 cases of forced marriage within immigrant communities in the United States in the two years preceding the survey. Since the Tahare survey was based on responses from service providers alone, the actual number of forced marriages is likely much higher. Forced marriage is different from arranged marriage. 
In many cultures, it is customary for families to arrange meetings between their children in the hopes of fostering a voluntary relationship that will ultimately lead to a marriage. In these scenarios, while the additional meetings, initial meetings are arranged by the families and a marriage is encouraged, the ultimate decision regarding whether to marry remains with the couple. So ultimately, the difference here comes down to consent and the freedom to choose one's spouse. There are many different reasons why an individual may be forced into a marriage. Cultural and religious traditions controlling unwanted sexuality, including perceived promiscuity, eradicating perceived or actual homosexuality, or being transgendered, controlling unwanted behavior, particularly conduct considered too Western, preventing unsuitable relationships, such as those outside a particular ethnic, cultural, or religious group, promoting and protecting family status, solidarity, or honor. Securing immigration status for the spouse and family. Enhancing the economic status of the family. Securing care for a disabled family member via the new spouse. Domestic servitude or paying for a wrong committed by another family member. Some of the common tactics for enforcing a forced marriage are as follows physical violence or threats of violence, emotional blackmail, for example, a mother who threatens suicide if her daughter does not consent to a marriage, removal from school, isolation and confinement in the home, ostracism from family and community, economic threats, such as a threat of disownment, threats to younger siblings, taking a child abroad and leaving her there until the marriage occurs, or conducting a marriage ceremony abroad without the victim being present. In many countries, this is permissible. A note now about coercion and force. Particularly when we talk about scenarios where no physical violence is involved, a family member may not realize that their behavior has crossed the line from merely encouraging an arranged marriage to forcing or coercing an individual to enter into a marriage. In these scenarios, it's important to remember that a party's yes to an arranged marriage is only as good as her ability to say no. We highlight some of the consequences of forced marriage. Indeed, being forced into a marriage is often only the beginning of a victim's suffering. Repeated violence and physical abuse may occur within a forced marriage, sexual abuse or rape within the marriage, the abuse of children of the marriage, social isolation, forced withdrawal from school or employment, psychological consequences such as anxiety and depression, self-harm or even suicide. So indeed, a forced marriage itself, again, may only be the beginning. There is considerable intersection between forced marriage and honor violence. Families that are upset with a child's uh, perceived shameful behavior may threaten her with a forced marriage as a way of controlling and ending that behavior. Resisting an arranged marriage may lead to honor violence and therefore transform an arranged marriage into a forced one. There also may be an intersection with human trafficking. A girl who is sold into a marriage for a dowry or immigration benefit may be repeatedly raped by the husband. So there may be an element of sex trafficking in this forced marriage scenario. A girl who is forced to marry and then forced to perform domestic chores such that it amounts to domestic servitude um, may overlap with issues of labor trafficking. So it's important to be alive to the ways in which forced marriage intersects with these trafficking issues. Before turning to best practices, I'll ask if there are any questions uh, specifically on the topic of forced marriage that have not yet been submitted. And again, you could use the chat feature on your screen to submit those questions, and Monin, who's here with me, will be happy to answer those uh, either verbally or responding to you individually. 
turning now to best practices. Best practices for working with victims. First, take allegations of honor violence seriously. A victim may report an incident that seems minor or insignificant, such as a parent being upset about the clothing she was wearing or the realization that she has a boyfriend. Resist the instinct to minimize the victim's fear. Seemingly small incidents can escalate quickly into serious violence. The victim is taking a risk in reporting the violence and her concerns, so her allegations must be taken seriously. The first contact may be the only opportunity to provide help. Don't let concerns about cultural sensitivity cause you to hesitate before taking action. Of course, it's important to be sensitive and alive to different cultures and different religions and how these affect the ways in which a victim or a family may, be, may respond to certain behaviors. All this to say, however, that coercion is coercion and violence is violence and cultural sensitivity should not stand in the way of action that you feel is necessary to protect someone. Second, be wary of family members. Remember that multiple members of the family may be involved in a campaign of honor violence or forced marriage. Although the victim may only report violence by one individual, other members of the family, including mothers, may condone and encourage that violence. The family may have no history with law enforcement or child protective services and may appear professional and polite. Do not let these appearances undermine the allegations of violence. Do not place victims in foster care with family members or individuals in the same cultural community without thoroughly investigating their views. Even if they have not been involved in the violence, any family or community member could sympathize with the perpetrator and put the victim in further danger. Third, stay involved. Victims of honor violence may be difficult to work with and may tell inconsistent stories, recant, or minimize previous allegations. Of course, this is not unique to the honor violence context, but there are certain factors that are, such as cultural and religious pressures, the involvement of the entire family and community, fear of complete ostracism and isolation from the family, concern over the welfare of younger siblings, and perhaps conflicted feelings of love for the, the offending family members. This may all contribute to the victim's willingness to consistently cooperate. Continue to follow up with the victim even if she reports that things have improved. Give the victim a code word that she can use to alert you if she's in danger. Keep the lines of communications open and remind the victim that help is available. Fourth, take action if a forced marriage appears imminent. Urgent action may be necessary if the victim reports that her family is threatening to send her out of the country to straighten out her behavior. This is a warning sign that she may be at risk for a forced marriage. Possible actions include helping the victim find emergency safe housing such as shelter or foster care. You could contact local law enforcement to explore protective options further. You could also contact the Office of Overseas Citizen Services of the Department of State and alert them to the victim's situation. They may be able to help if the victim is taken abroad. Counsel the victim about how to achieve safety if she is taken abroad. Discuss ways to alert TSA officers to her situation if she is taken to the airport, such as hiding a metal object in her clothing to obtain a private screening. And provide the victim with contact information for the U.S. Embassy or Consulate in the country, in the country she may be taken. We're pleased to we're advise pleased to that, that this fall, the AHA Foundation, the AHA Foundation will, be will be partnering with the Polaris Project to offer the, to offer the first national forced marriage hotline in the United States. And I'll let my executive, executive director, Manan Felice, just say a few words about that project. 
Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we will be launching this course marriage hotline. We'll also address issues of honor violence and hopefully will be October of this year. The phone number is one 94 honor H-O-N-O-R. And um, we will be sending you all more information about this as the launch date gets closer. And we'd really like to ask you to go towards your networks and try to spread the word that this hotline is coming. Thank you all so much. Okay. We just want to briefly talk about best practices for investigators, uh, appreciating that most of you are service providers or advocates. We still think that there are some worthwhile tips in here that may impact on your dealings should you ever encounter someone at risk for these issues. First, don't expect cooperation. A perpetrator of honor violence is unlikely to act alone. He may have assistance in planning or committing violent acts or in fleeing from law enforcement afterwards. Family and community will likely create a wall of silence that may impede law enforcement's investigations. This is particularly true of mothers, who often side with the perpetrator of the violence and against their daughters in an honor violence scenario. Even the victim's friends and sympathetic family members may be afraid to cooperate with an investigation. The community, to, the community dynamic in these scenarios may be similar to that in a gang-related investigation. There may be a great deal of fear in the community to assist in an investigation that involves a perpetrator of honor violence. Second, consider the involvement of other family members. When a victim reports an act of violence by one family member, consider whether other family members were also involved and themselves committed crimes. Examples of cooperation that may rise to the level of criminal activity include helping to plan the violent act, assisting the perpetrator evade law enforcement or hide evidence, interfering with an investigation by intimidating witnesses. Third, be cautious with translators. Avoid using a translator that comes from the same cultural community as the victim and perpetrator. There is a risk that the translator may sympathize with the perpetrator and interfere with the investigation, either through the translation process or by inter appropriately revealing confidential information. The victim may also be hesitant to speak freely using such a translator out of fear that the translator may report the allegations back to the family. Realistically, it may be difficult from a practical standpoint to avoid using such a translator, but it is important to be alive to these issues and this applies both to investigators as well as to service providers. In conclusion, honor violence and forced marriage are often hidden deep within families and communities with the victims left to suffer alone. The murders of Noor Almaleki and the Shafia sisters are just two examples of this phenomenon. They demonstrate that violence and murder justified by notions of family honor are indeed happening here. The victims are most often the young women who embrace Western culture with their entire hearts and souls and it seems little to ask in return that we protect them from suffering, suffering unspeakable harm and even death for doing so. You can save lives. As a child protective professional, you are in a unique position to help victims of honor violence and forced marriage. So be aware of these forms of violence and please share this information with your colleagues. The AHA Foundation is available to help. You can contact us for more information about honor violence and forced marriages. We can help locate service for victims and we can connect law enforcement professionals to experts who can offer assistance in specific cases. The help email address that you see on your screen is the one that should be used in case of a serious situation involving uh, an individual. Um, you can also email us at info at the AHA Foundation uh, for questions about our programs um, and about this presentation. And we would also appreciate any feedback that you'd like to provide us. We end with a quote from our founder, Ayan Hirsi Ali. 
To me, it is not racist to demand that I will not accept little girls in my country to be forced into marriage or their genitals to be cut, for them to be pulled out of school, for them to be condemned to a life of submission or violence or death through an honor killing. What you want for that girl is what you want for your own little girl. Please email us and let us know if you have encountered any cases of forced marriage or honor violence. You can send those emails uh, to me, julia at theahafoundation.org. You can also email me if you'd like to receive hard copies of our training materials. We could also send electronic versions to you if that's what you would like. I'm just going to double check with Monin to see if there are any outstanding questions that she hasn't answered individually. And it appears that there aren't. On behalf of the AHA Foundation, thank you very much for participating in our first webinar on the topics of honor violence and forced marriage. Again, please send us any feedback and thank you so much for joining us today.